Hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about runs, especially adherence, and we're going to see what this is and what are the challenges around uh, runness beacons. Um, just to very highlight a few words about adherence. Adherence is a runness beacon meant to be a, a foundational internet protocol for runness. Uh, it's a distributed bias resistance and predictable and publicly verifiable runness. We're going to see all what it means in a few slides, right? Uh, so the agenda for today is like I'm going to talk about a little bit about the context. Why do we need good runness? Different flavors varies. Uh, like this. Then going to get right into it into the technical backgrounds, uh, most uh, especially about threshold cryptography. Um, so we're going to see what is a Shamir secret sharing, what is a disputed key generation, and BLS signatures. Then going to talk about DRN itself, the protocol, how it works, how it uses this uh, cryptography. And then we're going to talk about the League of Entropy, which is a network that runs DRAND uh, right now uh, live on, on the main net. So why do we need runness at all? Um, in real life, we need runness in lotteries, jury selections. Uh, there's plenty of events actually where we need, do we need runness. And in digital life, we also need runness in plenty of places. For in protocols, for example, in blockchain, I'm going to talk a bit more about this at the next slide. Um, but as well for parameters in cryptography, like um, how do you choose uh, generators in a group for some schemes, for example, DFML uh, key exchanges, um, and for statistics uh, as well, um, and even for clearance and definition. There's really a lot of places where we do actually need runness. Um, why do we need good runness? Like, means what happened sometime in the past. Uh, there are like a few examples. One, one of uh, them is like a rig lottery. For example, a famous one has been um, 2010 from 2017. Uh, there's an insider that was able to rig the random generator uh, for the lottery in the US, and he was able to steal 14 million of dollars in prizes. Um, there's another fun example I like to mention. Uh, it's a ransomware example where uh, you know, when you develop a ransomware, you need to encrypt the file. And to encrypt the file, you need a key. And how do you generate this key? Well, you need some uh, randomness somewhere, uh, except if it comes from the network. But uh, sometimes you, you don't have anything. So you take the timestamp. So some random somewhere offer took the timestamp. And, um, but obviously, this is not uh, random enough. Like it's very easy to guess the timestamp at which it has been taken and, and decrypt the, the files. So even the ransomware offers need some good runness there. Um, and it's, what is especially is interesting for us today uh, is the kind of runness we need in blockchain because this is publicly verifiable runness. Like we need to ver verify that this runness is actually legit in the context of the protocol. And in blockchain, we uh, the way we use runness, one of the uh, most, uh, let's say, most used um, Runness in blockchain is for running leader election. So when uh, leader election, when the leader is a uh, minor or the participant that will be able to create a block and spread it to the network and increase the chain by one block. In Bitcoin, for example, we use proof of work. Um, and so once I find the right hash and then I can create my block and broadcast it to the network. And I've been, everybody will verify that the block, that the hash I found correspond to the right difficulty. Uh, there are also on-chain runness where you take some uh, blocks in the past and compute in the in certain way to uh, derive new runness variables to say if you are a new leader or not at this epoch. Um, in the future, we also want to use verified role data function. Still not there yet, um, but basically all these three methods is is what did the major landscape in, in leader election blockchain right now. And this is really a hot topic, actually. Uh, this is one of the reasons Ethereum 2 uh, has taken so much time to come up with a, its spec and, and system design. Um, and, and right now, we, we, we try to see a trend in, in, in industry moving to having a separate run on this chain, actually. Um, so this is kind of the landscape in blockchain. But what kind of randomness do we actually need? Um, so we need some runness which is unpredictable. So we can't predict the next numbers, the next bytes at all times. We need bias system. The output should always follow a uniform distribution. It must be publicly verifiable. This is really important in our use case that we're going to talk today. Uh, there are plenty of applications we don't need public verifiable um, uh, runness, but some, um, many of them that we're going to talk about today are too. Um, 
it's uh, we also wish this runners to be decentralized. Okay, we don't want a single party to be able to control uh, deliverance of this runners and available. Obviously, uh, we must always rely being able to rely on this uh, on the system to get some fresh runners. So. Uh, there's been some previous attempts to generate runners in, in the with the following the properties that I just mentioned. Um, one of them is NIST runners beacon. For example, it was based on the quantum entanglement. So they had the quantum experiments and they just took the output and, and they say, yeah, this is a random uh, number. So obviously it's really definitely unpredictable because it's guaranteed by the physics, uh, law of physics. Um, but we still need to trust NIST, right? We still need to trust NIST that uh, the server that gives, that's given me the runness yeah, really comes, uh, really takes the runness from the quantum experiment and not from someone that writes zeros and ones on a piece of paper, right? Um, there's been some experiment with Bitcoin as well. And uh, in the last few years, there's been a run, uh, the paper Runhound, uh, which uh, claimed to be uh, scalable, biosynthetic, and predictable, publicly available, and decentralized at the same time. So it looked like the real jipod. It uses solid cryptographic assumption. Unfortunately, it only offers probabilistic guarantees. It has a very complex setups, a large transcript to verify, multiple round trip times between the participants, uh, six second generation. So this was a lot of, uh, of moving pieces and it's very hard to put this into production. So the question now is, can we do simpler and faster, right? So this was the intro. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit about the cryptography and uh, some background in cryptography so you are able better to understand what is different uh, after. Okay, so some technical background here. And um, so one alternative method that we can do to generate from this is to use threshold cryptography, right? Uh, threshold cryptography, for those who don't know what it is, it allows to decentralize many centralized protocols. So for example, signatures, you can decentralize uh, signature generation. What threshold means here in, in this sense is that we require any T out of N participants to, to, um, to participate to create the signatures. Any subset of T participants um, will, will be able to generate a signature. If there are less than T, no signature will be able to generate it. If there are more than T, then it won't matter if you just generate the same signatures, um, depending on the on this exact scheme, of course. And yeah, so this is like the, the basic of the, the basis of the of the talk of different technique. So let's see how this works. Um, usually in, in threshold cryptography, you have two phases. You have the setup phase where the actual list of participants need to uh, some kind of coordinate together to create to create a shared key. Um, we're gonna talk. About, we're gonna talk to, uh, just next slide to see what it means. And this is like an expensive phase. You can think of it as a trusted setup party. Um, but um, this is only need to be run once, okay? And we can use the same code, the same logic to transfer from one group to the other, for n participants to another n participant uh, with higher number of participants or lower. Uh, we can talk more about this later on. Um, then there's a second phase, runness generation, which is after you've done the setup phase, then you can uh, make a very quick and lightweight protocol between the participants to actually uh, generate signatures. And this signature will be the basic basis for creating uh, the runness. So let's see how these two phases work. First, we need uh, some background in the Savage secret sharing, right? Because this is really one of the most used techniques in threshold cryptography. So let's see how this works. It's very easy. Um, so the goal here is to split the value. You have a secret value. You want to split it into n shares. So imagine this, this is your secret key of your wallet. You want to split it into n shares uh, to your friends such that at least t of these shares needs to be uh, collected together to be able to recreate the, the secret key, right and uh, the id uh, relies uh, by um, on a well-known algebra fact but used by shamir to to kind of uh, derive this protocol um, if you have a polynomial of degree key minus one then you only need key evaluation point to reconstruct this polynomial from the, by evaluation point i mean x y pairs where f of x equal y. Okay, so you have degree key minus one. If you evaluate this polynomial into uh, k points, then you can uh, reconstruct the whole polynomial. And so the protocol is actually pretty simple. We have uh, the notion of a dealer, which creates a polynomial f of x of degree t minus one. Okay, and so you choose the parameters t and n at the beginning. For example, t can be five and n can be 10. 
The first coefficient is a secret value S. Okay, so you, dealer has a secret value he wants to share. Okay, so we put this as a first coefficient here, as you can see here, there's a free coefficient here. And then it sends to each shareholder I their share FI. So that means if I'm the third participant, I will get F of three. Okay, if I'm a second participant, I will get F of two, and you get you create N shares in total, so 10 shares in my previous example. Um, if you want to recreate the secret uh, after all, uh, after you've shared the shares, like many times in the future, then you just uh, take any subset of t-shares, whatever the subset is, and then you run them through what it's called language interpolation. Um, for purpose of this talk, just treat this as a black box that takes uh, t evaluation points and is able to recreate either the polynomial or either the secret share. It can actually actuate, recreate the whole f of x, the whole polynomial. So we can we can uh, deduce the S here. So this is a good. Uh, now we want to move one step, for, one step further. Here, the dealer knows the secret because it put it itself into the polynomial. Um, we want to be able to have shares of a secret that nobody knows. That would be ideal, right? So how do we do this? Well, it's actually pretty simple because uh, now you can run um, the same thing, the same secret shamir, uh, secret sharing protocol n times in parallel, actually. And this is what we call distributed key generation, the most, at least, simplest version of distributed key generation. And how, so how it works, everybody uh, creates their own polynomial with their own secrets. So the first node creates a polynomial with secret S1, a second node with S2, et cetera, et cetera. And they all create their shares. So the first node will create the first share for F101, uh, the share for a second node F12, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this all runs in parallel. And every node will add their, all the shares they receive. So you see the first node will share the share for the first polynomial, the share for, for the second polynomial, the share from the nth polynomial, and we add them all together. Okay, just a uh, simple, addi uh, um, simple addition here. And same for the second node, and same for the nth node. Okay, they will all have shares. And it turns out, thanks to the beauty of algebra and, mag and math, that these shares are actually the shares of a secret S that nobody knows, nobody computed, but which is the sum of all the individual secrets here put that by the, um, all the participants, right? So now we have shares of a secret that nobody knows, all right? But thanks to the, uh, the way it works here, we can also compute the public key. So we can say, this is my, the secret key. And we can say, oh, the public key is simply the secret key uh, time multiplied by a generator of the group. So I don't want to get too much into detail, but basically this is what a secret key and public key is usually, uh, for example, uh, for e EDDSA or ECDSA in Bitcoin, your secret key is uh, the field element, then you have the public key, which is just the field element multiplied by the generator of the LEP curve, okay? And, and this is the public key, and we can know this. The public key in this protocol is simply the polynomial multiplied by the generator as well. So the public key is known, the secret key is not known, and everybody only has a share of the secret key. Okay, that's, that's the output. And what can we do with this? Well, actually, we can do a lot of things. And one of the things um, is signature generation. And the special type of signature that we're going to use here is called BLS signatures. Okay, so it's a little bit uh, complicated, but I'm just highlighting the, the main key points here. So in BLS signatures, we are using a special type of cryptography, which is called pairing-based cryptography. In this uh, setting, we have three groups with a mapping E. Uh, what I call a mapping is just a function that takes one point is G1, one point in G2, and the output a point in G2. These are three groups where you can have points inside. Uh, imagine they're all points on an elliptic curve. Like, uh, like the one you use for your uh, Bitcoin wallet or something like this, okay? And, um, and this, this function has a special uh, property, which is called binarity, where you have the equation A and B here, and then it's actually equal to the same thing, the binary mapping on R1 and R2, but the equation put at the exponents multiply together, okay? And this uh, property is actually uh, very, very powerful to create very uh, strong scheme and very powerful schemes. One of them is called BLS signatures. So BLS signatures is a very short signature, very simple to generate, and which have a lot of amazing properties. And um, let's see how this is created. So we have a message here, M, and actually the signature is simply we hash the message, okay? 
uh, with a general hash function. And we put this into a point over G1. Okay, so one of the um, group here that we have in the pairing base cryptography setting. Okay. Um, we, we know how to do this. We just hash a point, we put this over G1, and then we expansionate it or we multiply it depending on the way you see you see things via the secret key, right? Uh, this is pretty simple. Like I have a secret key, I just hash a message, I, I exponentiate it by a secret key, right? And the verification with the public key, which is known, is very simple. Just you call twice the, the pairing uh, map E, okay? You call with a signature and G2, this is just generator, and then you call as well with the hash of the message and the public key, so anybody can compute these two, um, and you look if they are equal. So pretty, pretty simple so far, um, but it leads to very efficient uh, and very powerful, actually, uh, signatures. And in this case, we can use uh, the BLA signatures in the threshold setting. That means instead of signing with the secret key here, you will sign with the secret share here. So the secret share is the one that you got from the distributed key generation. So if I am the first node, I will use S1 instead. Okay. And we get a T partial signatures now. It's not a complete signature, it's a partial signatures. And once I have T of them, then I can use like Lagrange interpolation again, the same thing that I use in secret chain receiving to reconstruct exactly the final signature here, um, H of M um, exponential to S, okay? And this is, uh, we can verify this final signature with the public key of the distributed key generation now, because this is the same as if I was already signing directly with S. This is where the magic comes from. So like, I'm just creating T partial signatures with V shares and then I use Lagrange interpolation to create a signature which is used with this, which has been signed by this secret key. Yeah. And so basically that's, that's the core of the techniques used in DRN. So we're gonna see uh, what exactly, how DRN uses them. So DRN is a software run by a set of independent nodes that collectively produce randomness. Okay, it uses a decentralized randomness service using threshold cryptography, like exactly as, we, as, uh, as I showed you. So we have a distributed key generation phase um, to generate these uh, secret shares with T equal N over two. So basically we always need more than 50%. This is actually the theoretical limit uh, of nodes to, co to collaborate together to create a signature and this signature, we use it as a source of randomness. Actually, we just hash the signatures. So the signatures that we create, the BLS signatures, we hash it and this is a uniform randomness after all. Um, we use the BLS 12, 381 uh, pairing curve, which is the same used on Filecoin, on Ethereum 2. It's a well known um, uh, pairing curves in the, sorry, in the blockchain ecosystem. Um, and um, Diren is an open source called in Go. It was originally coded at, uh, from uh, an effort at DDS at EPLFL and moved to an independent organization supported by Protocol Apps now. Uh, tested, audited, and deployed. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, Diren is meant to be uh, simple to do one thing and do it well, just to generate publicly verifiable randomness, right? And so you can even try it right now with curl and just a very uh, simple uh, URL here. So this is only one of the endpoints you can fetch uh, during doesn't rely on the centralized servers, obviously, because uh, Diren is decentralized. So um, how does the protocol works? Well, um, once we have done the discrete key generation, then the runless generation is simply a threshold BLS signature, like I said before. Uh, and the hash of the signature is runless. So the first stage is uh, the, the nodes will broadcast their partial signatures. And then each time, as soon as they got T of them, they reconstruct the full signatures and, and broadcast this to the, to the world. And so we actually tick all the boxes that we wanted. It's unpredictable and unbiasable from the BLS properties. Um, uh, because nobody, if you don't know the secret key, you cannot know the signature that you can generate in advance, right? And it's publicly verifiable because in the end it's a signature, so can verify that the signatures uh, is valid corresponding to the distributed public key. Uh, it's decentralized because it needs to be generated by multiple parties. It's available because we can always, we as a mean of threat model, um, we can always retrieve runness from honest uh, participants, and uh, it is quite uh, fast. I mean. The, the cost of uh, generating randomness is, um, so everybody does BLS signatures, partial signatures, and then you need to broadcast it and reconstruct T of them. So the, the more expensive phase is the reconstruction, the lagrange interpolation, but uh, this is still a very fast uh, operation. There's no, there's no big bottlenecks here. 
uh, unlike the, the distributed key generation, which is a more expensive uh, process. And how does uh, we represent randomness, right? So right now we have uh, a chain of randomness actually. So in Deren, we have this notion of round, like exactly in the blockchains where we have um, uh, around every new, every 30 second, right now it's 30 second, but it's, can be, it's a parameter. And at each round, there's only one possible new randomness. Okay, so there's no, there's no way to bias the, the chain. Like we already know that at this round, there's gonna be only one possible randomness uh, ever. Um, Deren has recently exceeded one million rounds. It's been more than a year and it's been running on a production setting. And we have this time round consistency, um, this strong time round consistency. So that means I know exactly uh, at which time is this one's going to happen, okay? Or either in the past or in the future. And that helps us a lot to be able to determine exactly uh, the integration with other applications. So for example, if I, in application the lottery, say, hey, the lottery is going to happen on Tuesday at, at five o'clock, then we know exactly which one is going to happen on Deron. So we can exactly expect to take the uh, randomness associated with this one, right? And the chain actually forms a chain. Uh, the, I'm <laughs> sorry, the DRAND uh, randomness actually forms a chain. So we can see here that the new randomness depends on the run number, the new run number, and actually the previous randomness here. Okay, so the run three depends on the run two, which depends on run one, et cetera. Et cetera. We actually working on a new V2 protocol when we uh, remove this dependency and remove this chain. Here and so the security model stays the same, but uh, the end chaining will be able to um, unlock new features such like, such like time lock encryption, and so we could may probably have a solution to mitigate front running attacks. Uh, but more on this uh, maybe later on. So finally, I come to the part where I talk about League of Entropy, and the League of Entropy is a global DRAM network composed of multiple independent and diversified organizations. So you can see here we have companies, we have universities, um, and we have Web2 companies and Web3 companies who try to uh, mix it all together uh, because we don't want necessarily DRAM to be tied only to the blockchain use case, but just as a general uh, runless um, uh, layer uh, for, for internet, right? Um, and so the, the League of Entropy is growing every uh, quarter. So we try to uh, onboard more, more, more members. And the goal of the League is actually to, to be a runless, to provide runless as a service. So you should think of it as the same way as if you have DNS, it provides you uh, naming information. If you have NTP servers, it provides you timing information. Well, we want the League of Entropy to provide you with runless service, right? As a foundational internet protocol for runless. Um, and so we, the League of Entropy is now a production ready network since last year. That means it's highly available. We have DDoS resistance mechanism. We separated the distribution network from the generation of the randomness. Uh, we can distribute randomness via HTTP, uh, lip 2 p Tor, Twitter. Uh, uh, we have partner diversity. I'm going to talk more about this um, in a few slides. Uh, we have the code base audited. We have everything you can figure out, continuous integration, test nets, we have health monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. And just as a, this is a quick slide on what is our network architecture here. So you can see in red, we have the DRAM nodes, which is connected by all red DRAM nodes, and we only have like IP firewalls uh, between them um, to, uh, to limit the, the communication from the external point of view. So there's like a strict uh, kind of private network between different nodes uh, where they only can talk to each other. And uh, so this is where they generate the randomness, right? And once a different node has a new randomness, then it can, uh, this, it can be connected uh, again, allowed by IPs um, to HTTP relays or gossip relays. So it's, it transformed, it uh, pushed the randomness to HTTP relays or gossip relays, which later gonna push out to the rest of the internet, right? Um, and so we also have a HTTP load balancer for CDN to cache the results in case there's a lo lot of frequency coming in. Um, and we actually do have a lot of uh, cache hit at the CDN level and the lip 2 p is especially relevant for a uh, blockchain system that use um, lip 2 p as their uh, network. Um, Private network layers, and um, yeah, that's that's a, a stack level. And um, this is a slide about the governance model of the League of Entropy. So obviously, we try to be as decentralized as possible, as we have a set of participants as large as possible. 
we want different different geographic position uh, position uh, different ju jurisdiction different interest as well uh, this is very important um and uh, if we for example uh one example i like to, sh to show here is that uh, you can see on the diagram um at, at below that we have uh, less than half of um, the servers are AWS, but we also have the same percentage on premise, which is actually quite good because we want every service to rely on AWS in case a region goes down or thing like this. We still need a threshold of them to be available and to be able to connect to each other uh, to generate one of this. Uh, new member application are open. Uh, you're welcome to have more info, uh, look for more info on their website. Uh, of course, every uh, there are some criteria to be eligible, and every uh, application is voted uh, by the members. And we change the network on a quarterly basis, uh, so we add new members or remove some. Um, and the shares are also refreshed every uh, quarter. And uh, this is the last slide about uh, who is using um, DRENT and who is consuming from the legal philanthropy right now. And uh, uh, there are multiple applications that are using Diren. Uh, for example, there are lottery, smart contract based lotteries on blockchain that use Diren. But here I want to talk about Falcon, which is the largest production grade consumer of Diren. And uh, so Falcon is a proof of storage blockchain. Think of it as a proof of stake, but your stake is a storage. And uh, so you have the, the headers that uh, depend on the previous header as usual. And each time on the header for each epoch, you have a runness associated. And this runness is directly mapped to a specific round in the League of Entropy uh, blockchain, right? In the, uh, sorry, League of Entropy chain. In uh, fact, one, as in many other pro uh, uh, blockchain, uh, you take some randomness and you hash it in a way which is unique for each miner. Okay, this is not really hash function, this is a verifiable uh, function, but for simplicity, I just put a hash here. And you check if uh, my power is, uh, if the result is inferior to my power over total power. So if I have 20% of the total power on the network, then the, run, the hash of the run dash should be less than 0 0.2. I put this number between 0 and 1, and I check if it's um, uh, uh, below 0 0.2. And uh, this, is, this is actually running live in production uh, for more than a year now, where FICON just take a run this from the run. Uh, and uh, a leader, uh, even minor checks if they are able to create a block. And if they are, they will just create their block, put the randomness inside, and all the chain will verify that the randomness is valid and it really correspond to the right uh, different um, uh, block. And uh, this is just to show you uh, very quickly that indeed it is created right now using uh, DRAN. So this is a very long curl uh, URL just to check from a certain um, tip set or certain uh, um, block, I take the beacon entries and I just look at the first one because there may be multiple ones for some reason, but I don't want to talk about it right now and take the data. And this is the data that we put in the, um, in the header, right? And then just to show you that it's exactly the same uh, from the round um, 489875, uh, uh, just look at the signatures and this is exactly the same here. And this is just a different endpoint than the one I showed you before, uh, because you can fetch from Cloudflare, you can fetch from Protocol App, you can fetch from over endpoints as well. Um, for me, that's it. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And if you want more information, um, and if you want to reach out, please uh, go see uh, dron.love or legalfantropy.com and uh, feel free to check out GitHub as well. Everything is open source. And uh, yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.